Good morning, everyone. We're going to get started in just a few minutes. If you wouldn't mind, please take a please take the opportunity to introduce yourself in the chat box. You can use your name, location, organization, and your preferred pronouns. But we'll get started in just a few moments. All right, so we're gonna go get, get started. I wanna welcome everybody today to today's webinar on Back to School Innovative Parent Engagement Strategies to Promote Gender Equality. Before I hand things over to Lori and Castell to introduce our, the panelists, I'm gonna go over just a couple of logistical items. Again, my name is Jennifer Clark. I'm the Operations Coordinator at the New York State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, and my pronouns are she, her. It, just a few items to go over. We are going to be muting everyone throughout today's presentation and do ask that if you have any questions that you enter them into the chat box. We will do, try and do answer as many as we're going through today and we'll also have time at the end for some question and answer period. If you would like to ask any questions, you can set anonymously, you can always send them directly to all panelists in the chat box. You do have the option at the top before, over where you enter text to choose to send it to all panelists or to all attendees. And we are going to be recording today's presentation and a copy of that as well as a number of additional materials will be made available to you after today's webinar in a follow-up email. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Lorian. Thank you, Jennifer. I really appreciate all that you do to make sure that the logistics are going well. Uh, first of all, I just want to say we're just so excited and pleased to see all of your interest in this topic. Um, and we've put together what we are confident is a, a compelling conversation um, with some information to share with you from our panelists and our facilitator, but also we're hoping that we can engage you in some back and forth and some really good dialogue. Uh, as Jennifer said, so the, you know, there will be a lot of you. You can unmute yourselves. You can raise your hand. If you put something in the chat, this is just a reminder that some people are on video and they're on computer and they can see the chat conversation. And some folks um, will be calling in and don't get to see the chat conversation. So it feels a little redundant if we're um, reading comments or questions, but that is for the benefit of everybody who does not have access to the chat box. So please do use that liberally. If you are using the chat box, it's sort of you're giving us some tacit permission to share what you have shared. Um, so I hope that that feels okay to you. But again, use the unmute and raise your hand and we'll put you in a queue for a conversation. So we're really excited to further our uh, efforts on engaging men and boys and the general public, right, Gina Cruz, on um, ways to engage uh, youth and also to provide some tools to prevention educators so that you can engage parents and specifically, as we're focusing on today, engaging fathers, male identified caregivers and father figures on how to engage youth, particularly at this time when folks are going back to school uh, during very unique circumstances and you know, providing a little extra modeling and support for young people who are going through transitions. So we're really excited about the Because We're uh, Dads initiative and have launched some uh, new materials that will be housed on our website. Uh, sort of, you know, in process as a product that will be in process for the, you know, the next several months. And without uh, further ado, I want to introduce our consultant and facilitator for today and also our panelists. 
So I, I, I just can't say enough about Russ Funk, who is, we've contracted with for many, many, many years on some of our engaging men and boys efforts over the years at Niskative, um, some statewide strategic planning, informing our uh, statewide prevention plan. And uh, just to, to say a little bit about Russ, and he can introduce himself too. He is the co-founder of North American Men Engage Network. He is the chair of the Policy Advocacy Committee there. I've worked with Russ. Uh, he's been a longstanding and trusted colleague who has served as a facilitator and a presenter for Niskative for many years. But I think I got to know Russ um, you know, pretty closely through our work as advisors and consultants to a national prevention work group, the Intimate Partner Violence um, Advisory Group that's funded by the Center for Disease Control and convenes just a few state coalitions and some other national experts on domestic violence prevention and sexual assault prevention. And it's convened by the National Resource Center. So, and we're still getting together a couple times a year to make sure that there are really stellar resources that are um, uh, you know, shared with folks all across the country. So, so that's Russ, and I can't say enough about how much he's been able to help us really design uh, the Because We're Dads initiative. And uh, we're really excited to share those resources with you. Next, I'd like to just very briefly introduce our panelists. They're going to introduce themselves as well, but I want to give a sort of a personal shout out to both of these folks, and that's Gina Cruz and George Kilpatrick, who will serve as presenters and panelists today and sort of help with you know, their vast expertise and their deep knowledge around prevention, particularly around engaging men and boys. You know, they'll be contributing to the conversation that we hope all of you will be contributing to as well. So Gina is the CEO of Heels of Greatness and co-founder of the National Father's Day Pledge, among many other initiatives and projects that she's been involved with uh, here in Rochester, New York. So she's a, a colleague who lives in my community. She's a mover and shaker, just as all of our panelists and facilitators are. Um, and I'm going to let her tell you a little bit about the other things that she's involved with. Um, but talking about Gina prompts me to want to give a shout out to another colleague of ours, uh, Quentin Walcott, who is the co-director of Connect in New York City and also a longstanding colleague. He would be here today to share with you some of the strategies that he's using to engage uh, men and boys, particularly during pandemic with weekly roundtables that he does for uh, New York City based folks. And he's the founder of the New York City Father's Day Pledge uh, and often comes up to Rochester to uh, Father's Day rallies that, that Gina coordinates. So we're all sort of connected a little bit by you know less than six degrees of separation. He's actually presenting a really amazing workshop right now for the CalCASA, the coalition, California Coalition Against Sexual Assault and uh, Prevent Connect's National Sexual Assault uh, Prevention Conference that they do every year virtually. So he couldn't be with us here today. Um, and then I, I want to also uh, introduce George Kilpatrick. And uh, we've also known each other for many, many years. We've, we've contracted with him to present on his experiences engaging men and boys in the Syracuse area. But like Gina and Russ, he also has a local, regional, statewide, and national reach in some of the work that he does. He is the men's outreach coordinator for Vera House in Syracuse in Onondaga County here in New York. Um, he has a radio program. He's um, been convening some really interesting meetings uh, regarding uh, how men, and particularly men of color, and folks are doing, uh, considering the, the, the sort of national uprising that is going on to address uh, police brutality and racial justice and equity issues. So he's got a lot to offer as well. Um, all of our panelists are, as I've said, are movers and shakers in their own right. Their resumes are two pages long. I could stand here and sing their praises you know, forever, but I really wanna get to the content. So I'm going to turn it over to our facilitator. I wanna thank you all for being here with us today, our panelists and everybody who is on the, um, on the meeting. I hope that you will share uh, 
um, freely the things that you're thinking about when it comes to engaging men and boys, but particularly fathers and male identified caregivers and father figures during this time. So Russ, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Lorian. Uh, that was a wonderful, very gracious introduction. Thank you so much. I am so happy to be back, as it were, in New York with you all. Um, I love New York. I am speaking to you from Louisville, Kentucky, my home. Um, and I'm very excited about this webinar as well. I, I think I am, I'm speaking to you as a dad. You may hear some background noise in the back of my house as my, <clears throat> we have already started school here in Kentucky and my son is um, on his computer, he's 10, um, in doing virtual classrooming right now. Um, and so part of this whole project is thinking about um, the ways that being a father particularly um, positions men or male identified people to be involved in this work. And as a movement, we have not done such a good job of thinking about how do we, how do we mobilize dads who are already mobilized to get involved in this work. Um, and this back to school moment, um, particularly in this, in this context, I think I feel as a dad in this work, I feel to be a particularly right moment to think about what does it mean to use this moment as an opportunity to reach out and connect with, with dads. I know as preventionists, this is a, a, a really daunting task because I don't know so much about in New York. I know in Kentucky, um, our schools are closed. All of our schools are virtual. So prevention educators aren't going to school to provide presentations. Um, the schools are differently unavailable for prevention educators here in Kentucky to be able to, to offer presentations to, to, school, to kids. And that makes it even harder to reach out to parents or dads. So I think I understand that, that that's a, a particular burden right now, probably for many of you all whose, whose school districts are also planning on starting virtually. Um, and this might maybe gives us a chance to do some different kind of thinking around how we might engage dads in our communities at this moment. Um, one of the things for this presentation, we're going to be particularly talking about those transition years um, from elementary to middle or, or junior high school, from junior high school to, to, to high school, and then from high school to college. And the particular challenge and opportunities that are presented by those, those transitions. Um, kids are differently worried about that shift from, uh, in my case, thinking about shifting from elementary school to middle school. Um, he's already identified middle school as, as the bully zone. Um, and so what does that mean in terms of what he's, what he's looking forward to and how he presents himself? Um, <clears throat> and this, as we all know, this, the, the pandemic has created a, a particularly hostile time for us to think about doing our work um, organizing, mobilizing, educating is all different now in this, in this mostly virtual context. And again, coming to you from Louisville, Kentucky, um, Brianna Taylor is, is our, our latest victim. Um, one, of the, one of the names that is known nationally and, and so within this context of trying to, to do this work in the pandemic, in the, t in the context of an uprising makes our work that much more important. So for today's conversation, we're going to talk about how we use this moment and this role of, of dads as supporting our children into the school and into the transitions of schools to think about what does that mean in terms of our work to engage, engage dads. Um, I'm really excited for, for Gina and, and George to share their stories. Um, we're going to give each of them about 10 or 15 minutes to share some of their experience and some of the lessons learned. I hope in the meantime, I really encourage you all to throw out your questions. Um, I have a few questions that I came up with and that we came up with as a collective, um, but I want this to be more, more our, our conversation with you and, and the, as the participants than our conversation as George, Gina, and I. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, throw George to you next, um, so get ready. Um, he'll talk a little bit about his experience and his work in, in Vera House. Um, and as he's, again, as he's kind of sharing what he's got to say, please track your comments and your questions so that we can come back and, and uh, Try and, try and get back with them during the discussion. George. Thank you, Thank you Russ. My name is George Kilpatrick and my pronouns are he and him. Uh, and I work at Vera House as the men's outreach coordinator. I've been at Vera House for eight years and I came to Vera House uh, after doing a lot of ally and accomplice work uh, in the community. At the time that uh, I started to be engaged with Vera House, um, I have a radio show, but I also was the host of a public television show on WCNY TV in Syracuse. And so uh, whenever those issues around domestic violence and sexual assault came up, uh, I was available to Vera House to provide 
uh, a voice in a forum to amplify their voices around this issue in the community as someone who has seen family members impacted and affected by uh, domestic violence as well as sexual assault. And so I wanted to be someone who would use the platform that I had in media, particularly to, to raise voices. So we partnered with Vera House to do a variety of different programs around uh, letting the community know uh, what the services were, but also to talk honestly and candidly about how this is impacting various communities, including uh, talking to perpetrators and them telling their own stories about why they did it, well, not necessarily why they did it, but what are the factors that they know will lead to uh, deviance in cases. Uh, and so uh, after that, I was asked by uh, Vera House to be the honorary co-chair of the White Ribbon Campaign. And during that campaign, I, before I said yes, I was like, well, am I worthy, right? Because did somebody see me in the mall doing something that maybe I shouldn't have been doing or said something in a tone that I shouldn't have said it? But I came home and asked my family. I said, uh, they, they've asked me to, to be the honorary co-chair of this White Ribbon Campaign. And this was uh, in 2009, it's about 10 years ago. And the, I was like, well, am I worthy? And thankfully they said yes. And so I, I then ended up being the honorary co-chair. So uh, that was one of the ways that I got engaged in the work. And then about three years later, uh, I got a call and said, hey, I, I had uh, transitioned or the, the TV station transitioned without me. And so I got a call and said, hey, would you consider coming in and doing some work with us? And that's how I got engaged uh, with the work uh, in Vera House. And so uh, that's what brought me to the work, but also uh, wanting to make sure that uh, for the things that I saw in my life and my community, that I would be able to be an ally or, if you will, an accomplice. Um, I should tell you that I am, a, I am a dad as well as a prevention educator leading our program in Syracuse. Uh, I have two adult children and two children who are in college. So uh, that, that's my legacy. So three girls. Uh, and one boy, um, male identified, female identified, and I'm, you know, just navigating like all other parents around how to talk, how to how to experience them. Um, they had uh, my two daughters were in college, and uh, their school shut down in the middle of March, and so that meant that they had to come home and finish their semester at home. So there are six of us in the family, so we were all gathered together, and we worked it out, and we, and we got through it and uh, we were able to, to get through it. Um, in terms of some of the work that uh, I've been doing and some of the things that I've learned in the work uh, in terms of engaging dads in particular, uh, I've worked with the Syracuse City School District. They have a parent engagement initiative. I think that's what it's called. And so I presented to uh, both uh, dads and moms, if you will, around you know healthy relationships, warning signs. And I found that in those spaces and in those environments, there was a hunger and thirst for the information because people often did not recognize uh, the signs of, of, of a relationship that wasn't really healthy. So we, we, we talked about some of that. But here's one thing I'll tell you. Uh, this is one of the lessons that we've learned uh, that uh, men in particular, and maybe dads in particular, they're hungry for the conversation. It's just getting them in the room to have the conversation. And so we found that uh, they're not coming to talk about domestic violence, sexual assault, and, and, and they're not coming to that conversation. But they are coming to a conversation around leadership. They're coming to a conversation around, uh, and, uh, prote uh, if you will, protection of their families. They are coming to a conversation about how to be there for their youth. They are coming to a conversation around uh, you know, leadership within the community, around making the community safe. They're coming to that conversation. So that's, we have an initiative that we do called Real Men, Real Talk which we say is a space where some of the men who have gone through some of our training also sit with men in the community that are male identified that have not gone through the training and then have uh, these authentic and real conversations. And I think that's another thing that I've learned uh, as, as an educator out here in the community is that what men want, uh, even though they don't admit it, is they want authenticity. You, as a, as a storyteller, you got to put a little bit on the table so that, uh, and when I say a little bit of yourself on the table, uh, so that that can open up the room and give them some space to feel, oh, okay, I can talk about 
the, un the things that I don't talk about. And one of the things that we have started to do very recently, uh, two things we've started to do very re recently in terms of engaging men, but some of them who happen to be dads, is we've asked them to name times in their life when they have contributed to a culture of violence and abuse. And we do this in sort of an anonymous way. So they basically put uh, their thoughts, real the things that they actually have done. And then uh, the next week in our next session, we would uh, put those uh, things that they've said uh, up on a screen and then, if you will, process through them, right? And why do we do that? Because uh, a, a lot of times as we're going through the work and having conversations with men and dads in particular, they're not recognizing some of the actual harm that they've caused. What they don't they don't recognize it, right? They, they didn't know, if you will. And so when we when we talk to them about that, it, it gives them a space to actually see, oh, and also know that they're in community with other people. So that's one other thing. And the other thing I'll say is that uh, we I, I just recently uh, asked uh, about five male uh, black male therapists uh, around the country to engage with me in a conversation around this particular idea, especially in this moment, this idea that we are not okay, right? That, you know, as, as men, that we are able to be vulnerable with one another uh, in order to have this, this healing taking place. Because quite frankly, it feels like an assault every day. And we, you know, uh, 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 in Rochester, New York right now, we have another incident uh, that was just released, right? Where uh, a man was, uh, uh, was uh, shot, uh, not shot, but you know, killed by the police on video, and we just saw that. And so, in the context of you know George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, all of this, we provided a space and an environment for men to talk openly about how they were feeling right now in this moment, and not being able, and not, and also being able to uh, talk with cl clinicians that not only could help them therapeutically, but also as black men provide some, what do you call it, uh, 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 empathy, right? Because I, you know, look, I know how you feel. Uh, but here's what happened. You know, I've, I've gotten calls from men who were on that call who said, you know, as a result of, of that call, I've started to have circles with my buddies around having conversations so that we can provide that space where we can just talk. Men want that environment, all right? Male identified dads, they want that environment where they can speak openly, but uh, they're not finding it open, uh, open for them. And the other thing I was gonna say that I've learned is that you have to also recognize that, 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 that trauma often shows up in the room, right? And so how do you, how do you recognize uh, the trauma in the room and that each room is gonna be different? Uh, when I say each room, uh, I mean the training that we provide, I'll say uh, uh, in my two minutes I have left, I'll talk a little bit about how we actually do this training but um, it's engaging dads, engaging men is not a one size fits all, right? The, you know, if you're doing it in a corporate environment, if you're doing it in a community-based environment, we know, right, as presenters, we know, know your audience. Well, this is especially true uh, in, in engaging dads, know your audience and be prepared for the trauma that shows up in the room and then dealing with that uh, or providing the space for that to happen in the moment. And I remember, uh, 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 doing a training with a group of men who were uh, part, they were they had some contact with the criminal justice system. So they were like in between either on probation or on their way to it, whatever. And one of the questions that I asked them to consider was, are you the type of guy that you, assuming it's a heterosexual relationship, are you the type of guy that you would want your daughter to date? And the guy stood back and he came back the next week. He says, he says, yo, this is in the vernacular. This is how he spoke to me. He said, yo, that messed me up. Because when I thought about that question, that really made me think about the relationship that I had with, with my partner and the impact that it was having on my daughter. And so another lesson that I learned is that the best uh, modeling is what the people in your life, and this is what we tell our, our, the men that we engage, the fathers that we engage, the best model for what your children are going to see uh, is going to be right in front of them. How, how, what do they see? How are they observing the relationship that you have with your partner? 
right? Are they, are they seeing healthy relationships or are they seeing something else, right? And so that's another piece. And I guess uh, quickly that uh, the work that we do is all centered around what we call our 12 men model, which is uh, getting uh, men together in a conversation, five sessions, about an hour and a half, uh, where we unpack uh, uh, DVSA and, and all other, and other forms of abuse, but also ask men to be accountable to one another. And so uh, we created, uh, it's not our original idea, but one of the things we started doing in our most recent trainings is doing what we call this buddy system, where we're asking the men to be accountable uh, to one another and check in each and every week. Uh, this, uh, our work has been studied by Cornell University in terms of its impact and also uh, looked at by the CDC as, a, as a, an invaluable uh, process. So uh, there's a lot of work to be done, obviously. Uh, some of the engaging men work that we do does involve dads, uh, but just from the little bit I just shared, those are some of the ways that we engage men who happen to be dads. Awesome, thank you so much, George. And one of the points you raised, there's a lot there that I wanna um, kind of bounce back to after, after uh, Gina, you share, but, but one of the things that I thought was really important was the, this idea of, of no, no, not one size fits all. And, and one of the global conversations right, right now that we're having within the engaging men movement, the engaging men work, is this idea of, of how, do we, how do we talk and strategize about engaging men that doesn't reinforce and actually magnify the gender binary and this, this idea of what, what being a man is. And I think that's particularly true in terms of this conversation around dads. Um, we're not, we're, we're talking about engaging dads and we, we understand at least the, the Lori and Gina, George, uh, Jennifer and I, that, that dads come in all kinds of shapes and sizes and, and the children that, that dads parent are all kinds of shapes and sizes. And there's all kinds of, of nuance and complexity there. Um, and so we wanna encourage that the opportunity to, to talk to lean into that complexity and that nuance during during the Q&A period of this of this conversation. Um, so great, Gina, I'm going to bump it over to you and talk a little bit about the, the National Father's Day pledge and and the other really awesome work that you've got going on. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is um, Inabel Gina Cruz. I like to be called um, Gina. Um, as Lorian said, um, Quentin um, started the Father's Day Pledge back in 2010 in New York City. But then he called me in 2013 and said, hey, we want to be able to take this nationally. Um, and that's what, what we ended up doing in 2014. We connected with the national Black elected um, officials. And at that time, the president was um, our former um, Councilman Adam McFadden, and we took this pledge nationally um, to 50, we, we've been in 55 city, 55 plus cities in state, um, several states, and also in two countries, where we talk to you, um, where we stand at the steps of the, um, at, the, at the steps of the city of Rochester or the steps of any officials wherever they are in, in any state. And we take a pledge against violence, um, not only domestic violence, but um, all forms of violence, whether it's gang violence, in, um, elder violence, we have human trafficking to ours, and of course, systemic racism, uh, we add it as well. I am a survivor of domestic violence and I've been um, uh, doing domestic violence work about 20, 20 some, well, two decades, we're gonna say. And my work revolves around um, going out into the community, educating um, and doing workshops on domestic violence with lawyers, with um, Cornell. We've done a workplace violence initiative. Um, we've also, uh, have built the first ever um, one-stop shop here in Rochester called Heal at the University of Rochester, where you can come and get everything all in once. In order of protection, we were the first ones to ever do our order of protection via Skype. Um, we also have um, prevention, education, and all kinds of other things there. Um, the Father's Day Pledge, um, also we continue to do things with them through it. Um, and so that's what I, where, where I started at. Um, 
As far as the Father's Day pledge, um, we have information on it. We can put it up for you. Um, you can take uh, the Father's Day pledge. You're able to go to the National Father's Day pledge dot, um, dot com or dot org, either one. Either one will take you there and you can see um, more information on the Father's Day pledge where you're able to take the pledge against violence and stand up a a against violence. Um, we have had uh, great success with it. We've had several men and, and, and come from it and then go into their own initiative. Um, they will go right into their own initiative and start something, a program. Because one of the things we say at the end of the Father's Day pledge is that um, it doesn't just end at taking a pledge. You could take a pledge and, and, and sign anything but you must stand up in your communities, your homes, your schools, and, 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 and everywhere. So we would have men, men and the public and young men take this into their schools, talk about it. If they see some bullying, if they see some, someone talking to someone negatively, they would say, hey, we need to talk about this. Well, you're not supposed to talk this way, you know? So that's one of the things that, that, that happens from the Father's Day Pledge. It just doesn't end at the steps of the city hall. It goes on beyond there. We got um, stand-up guys who have been doing this work for several decades as well, who, who speaks at it and talks a lot about engaging fathers and, and doing preventive work with fathers in the community. Um, they've been doing it for over 10, 20 years as well, um, going into the communities, going into schools and things like that. And we work together um, all the time trying to reach out into the community. The thing is, it's a lot of trauma-informed issues that are going on in the community right now. Um, so that's another thing that we've been trying to reach out into, uh, whether it's a father or, uh, or a community activist or anyone, we try to talk to them about trauma as well. Um, so that's where we've been doing with uh, domestic violence here. We also have a, a group called SAFER. I'm the president of SAFER. And with SAFER, it's a round table. It's a free space where you could come and communicate about um, and talk about any issues. It's a round table to talk about domestic violence of uh, issues that they're having. And it's both men and women. It's just not um, women. It's both men and women can come to the table and talk about domestic violence, um, issues in the community, problems with their children, if they're facing issues with um, domestic violence or bullying or dating violence. Um, we talk about that as well. Um, and, and SAFER does that with it. Um, we also here in the community have a lot of um, opportunities for fathers to be able to go out and um, get engaged in the community with um, Black Men Achieve. Um, they have a round table as well where they help out with the youth and engage the youth with different, a variety of prevention work and coaching boys and men um, in, in their activities. So I collaborate with them on some things and go do trainings with them and domestic violence and workplace violence and prevention with them as well. Um, there's a whole lot of things that are going on here in the community here in Rochester where you can actually go out and help with prevention and education. What is most important is that we try to reach our youth at, a, at an early age. And I think that's what I love about the National Father's Day Pledge because the fathers come, they come with their, parent, their, their significant other, they come with their children, um, people come with groups of children, um, and they stand in the steps and take pledges towards um, violence of all forms of violence at, at the um, Father's Day Pledge. We do it every year, the Saturday before Father's Day. And this year, we, um, well, 2021, we plan on taking it nationally over to Washington. And we hope that many of you can join us. Um, and again, you can go to the National Father's Day Pledge um, dot com and sign up and find out more information on it. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you both, Gina and George, again, for your contributions. I love hearing what, what y'all got going on. And, and Gina, the, the array of things that you have going on in Rochester is really quite, quite impressive. Um, 
there are a couple of things in your conversations that I want to bounce back for before I, I ask some other questions. And this might start a conversation amongst the three of us or four of us, um, Lorian, if you, if you chime in. Um, one is the, this idea of, of as, as George pointed out, how do we get dads in the rooms that we're, that we're trying to do? And I think both Gina and George have a really good model of how we do that. And, and some of the things that I want to kind of point out from what I heard is, is from, from Gina's example of the, of the pledge, start simple. Um, one of the things we know as organizers is that volunteers don't, aren't going to do the work if it's too hard. You know, my, my life is already hard. I'm, I'm, I'm a dad, I'm involved in Kieran's school. I'm, I'm sometimes the coach of his teams that I'm not an athlete, but you know, that's a whole other story. Um, I'm involved in my church. I'm involved in a lot of things. And so if you're going to come to me with another request, don't make it too hard. And ending gender-based violence, promoting gender equality, whatever you want to frame this, that work is heavy, is a, requires a heavy lift. So as Gina kind of alluded, we start with, with relatively simple asks to get folks into the room, into the door, in this case, dads, but follow that up with, what's your part of the heavy lift? And that's a shared lift. So often that, the, the, what Gina has going on is that with these individual pledges, that individual connection as a way of what I can do, but then bring them in to what George described is bring them into a community of other men that support them to do the work. One of the driving theories behind this work that I really want to reinforce is called male peer support theory. And it was originally developed in understanding why it is that men perpetrate violence. And what they found, Walter de Kessetri and Martin Schwartz, what they found in terms of one of the reasons why men perpetrate violence is that they have a male peer support network. And it, that seems to be really critical that it's a male peer support network that supports the attitudes behind the violence. Now, their male peer network may not support the actual violence, but they support the attitudes and beliefs that drive the violence. We have every reason to believe, although it has not been researched yet, but we, we have every reason to believe from our practice experience that the flip side is also true, that men who get engaged and stay engaged have a male peer or a, a peer support network, not necessarily as importantly male, but I think that's a critical factor, a peer support network that, some, that supports them to do what we're asking them to do. And I think George, your model of, of, of strategically having these conversations with men who are already in a community with each other, or to making sure you, you focus on building that community with each other before you start with the ask is another really critical entree point in terms of mobilizing men, mobilizing dads. And, and George, I love the idea that you are doing specifically work with dads in your community to bring them in the room as dads. I wanted to follow that with a question for the, for the four of us um, around thinking around um, what are some other methods that you all have learned or are aware of and that, that kind of combine those two ideas of, of something to, that's relatively simple as a way to get men in, get dads in, in this case, and building on the sense of, we're part of a community that's taking, that's taking hold. Um, and then there's also a question in the chat too, just wanted to recognize oh, that. thank uh, you. Okay, um, around uh, whether Native American and Hispanic uh, men, as the question was asking, are part of the organizations. We have had, uh, one of the outreach that we've done is through, we had a lat Latino professional network in Syracuse a few years ago, uh, and they, we, we use that network uh, to do that. Uh, we haven't had as much connection to uh, the indigenous people in our community, but uh, we uh, hope to do more of that and, 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 and bringing all people to the table. Uh, particularly to your question about other mechanisms, uh, sometimes just having, uh, one, I, I want to call them one-offs, but uh, the White Ribbon Campaign is one of the ways in which we bring men into the community. Uh, we do what we call a White Ribbon Walk, uh, and because we also are working with the youth through the Men of Strength Clubs, which is a mentoring program through Make and Stop Rave out of Washington that we implement in five city schools in our in our community. You know, you've got the combination of those youth plus adult men uh, who some who happen to be dads uh, together in community, uh, and that's one way that we have uh, engaged men in community. A lot of people come to that walk. We didn't have we couldn't do it this year, but uh, a lot of people uh, come to that walk, and we've seen uh, that be an engagement that uh, in some ways is catalytic for them to get involved in other ways. 
Uh, that's one thing that we're doing. The other thing that we are doing, and, and this, is, uh, this is the slower process, but we're trying to do this, is uh, by building a community-wide strategy, we've created what we call a multidisciplinary team or a coordinated community response, if you will, right? And so we're talking to other violence prevention groups uh, in the community to link DV and SA uh, to community-based violence because oftentimes domestic violence uh, agencies, we're dual support. We do both DV, SA, and we have a, a shelter um, in our community. Uh, often we've been divorced from that larger, broader community conversation around how do we end community-based violence. So we've invited those individuals to the mm -hmm. table so that we have a, could have a more comprehensive uh, approach and strategy. Awesome. Thank you, George. Um, I would say the first stop um, we've had is this, the Father's Day pledge, um, where they come and take the pledge. But then we're going into the schools. Um, a lot of the schools have um, parent-teachers conference um, and things like that. So we go in there and we communicate with them and we talk to the fathers there um, who are in the room um, and ask them to go out and take the pledge to their sororities, their mm -hmm. fraternity, I mean, fraternities and their, and sororities, because the women do too, um, and to, to their churches and their communities and in any place where they can talk about domestic violence or even bullying, any, any types of violence. Um, that's one of the things that um, we've been doing. I've worked with Ali O'Malley, who used to be the CEO of, um, of Resolve, and we've gone into the schools to talk about this um, in, in, in all the schools. The other thing is um, talking to the men, um, engaging them, and finding out well, what, what is it that they need? What is it that is going on that can help them with either the the children or how how to address it how to address the issues with them letting them know about um domestic violence awareness month letting them know stalker awareness month dating violence awareness month to be able to do something in their programs that they have for instance black men achieve always talks about um, domestic violence at their event. They talk about how men can take stand up and take the pledge, how men can mm -hmm. be an ally for their children. Um, and not only that, we also have um, uh, my brother's keeper who does the same thing here with the boys. Um, so they'll call on me and, uh, and I'll call Moses, um, uh, Moses Robinson, who's an officer here. He does coaching boys to men as well. And we'll go, we'll go to these places and we'll discuss these issues on, um, with, with the, with the um, kids, with the fathers, with the parents and, and say, it doesn't stop here. Bringing awareness doesn't stop here. You take it wherever you go. You know, you see something going on, make sure you uh, talk about it. Say, hey, that's not the way you respond to this. So it's, it's important for us to, and not only that, X, one of the things we all asked here today was, um, what do we want to be called? He, she, or what? Make sure we ask that so when we're addressing people that we're, a, we're able to address them in the proper way and talk to them about domestic violence. It doesn't just happen to women, it happens to men, happens to their children, it's going on bullying everywhere. So we wanna make sure we address it in each and every one of those areas, especially gang violence with all the things that are going on today as well. And, and Russ, can I just pick up, I forgot to mention that we also engage my fraternity, Omega Psi Phi fraternity in our community as well. If I didn't say that. Listen, I was going to say it for you, but I didn't. <laughs> yes, because the mom, the mom mix is very active here with it. <laughs> yes, yes. I would have said, yeah, I wanted to say that engaging, and so the point of it is engaging already groups that already yes. exist. Right, yes. you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, right? They, they're, they're already in good, 100 black men, other groups like that, they're already uh, engaging uh, in that way. So it's just bringing everybody to the table for the shared goal. And Russ, which, can I just add, is, Russ, can I just add one more thing really sure. quick? I think knowing our resources is a key. Um, we have Willow here 
And um, Willow helps out men and women. So letting people know that these services are available. This year during COVID, what, one of the things that I did is letting people know that they're not alone and they're loved. So I had men, women, um, Hispanics, uh, leaders in our community, survivors, all do a video and come together and say, these are the resources that are available to you nationally, locally, and um, regionally. And they made a video letting them know, hey, you're not alone. Um, it was important. I've gotten so many calls because of those videos, not just you know women, but men. Men are saying, wow, I can't believe you put that up there. I can't believe you care so much about us, you know? So it was important for them to, to have that, the LGBT community as well. So it's important to make sure we know our resources, what, what is available in our community to be able to give to um, not just the children, but the parents as well. And I think kind of bringing this back, more, more focused on, on the conversation about engaging dads and how can we use these kind of lessons learned around specifically focusing on dads. George, I really appreciate your point around, um, at both of y'all actually, in, in terms of there, there, a lot, there are groups that already exist for men. Mm -hmm. There are less groups that exist for dads. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, that's a lesson to th think about how do we mobilize men rather than trying to, to capture men from wherever they are into a group, go where they're already grouped. And where are those groups of dads in your communities and how can you connect and reach out to those dads to engage dads as a collective? George, one of the things when you first started um, that you talked about that I think is worth spending a moment on is how you... Have you found a different kind of engagement when you reframed the, the opening question? And it was parallel to a, 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 an experience that we had here in Louisville of engaging men to prevent domestic violence or prevent sexual assault. And we'd be, we'd be at community fe festivals or community events and we have our banner out and we have, have our material out and men would walk up with their beer in hand, take, take a couple, couple of steps forward, see what our materials were and then keep walking, right? Mm -hmm when we shifted the language and talked about engaging men to promote gender respect or gender equality or gender justice, all of a sudden, same experience, same spaces, same men with the beer in their hand would walk up and continue and come up to the table. And what it, rem what it reminded me, Gina, to your point about being trauma-informed, is that the language that we often use, preventing domestic mm -hmm. violence, preventing sexual assault, preventing icky, icky stuff, is a turnoff for a lot of our dads. And that's not necessarily pathological, though that's not necessarily a sign of resistance. Frankly, y'all, that's a sign of health. Who in their right, who in their right mind, when, I, when I'm wearing my, my, my hat as my, the father of a 10-year-old, the last place I want to go with him is a conversation about rape and sexual assault. Right? I want to go to a conversation with him around consent, se healthy sexuality, gender respect, but I don't want to have a conversation with my son about the icky stuff. I do it because that's my job, but I don't want it, right? And back, Gina, to your point about the simplicity of the initial act of the pledge, if we're making this simple, how can we re rethink about how we're promoting this in a way that's actually engaging as opposed to disengaging? And if the language that we're using is at its surface disengaging, let's back up and see, and, and George, you provided a great example of this back up a little bit and shift our language that doesn't lose anything of our agenda, but it becomes differently engaging for the, for the, for the dads that we're trying to engage. Yeah, and then I saw the question about um, how, how open are we to, to the LGBTQI um, community? Um, and I think, George, I see that you have, have an answer ready to go. I, I think for me and my work in, in Kentucky and for our work in terms of the, um, because we are dads, um, package or, or uh, 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 effort that we're doing with Niscative. We haven't drilled down specifically yet to different pockets of men, different audiences of, of dads. Um, the idea is that regardless of where you're positioned, if you are a queer dad, if you are the, the dad of a queer child, there are some, there is still some opportunity for you, whatever your identity, other identities are as a father, there are still opportunities for you to be engaged in a way that advances the, the agenda, gender equality, gender justice. And by, as whole, one of the reasons that Lorianne came to me was that that is a gap in our movement right now in this country. 
that there's lots of great resources in terms of engaging men, but in, specifically in terms of what is our role as a dad. I don't know what my son's gender identity is yet. I don't know what his sexual orientation is yet. I don't know that he knows. Right now he identifies as a he, but that may change. He's only 10. Um, and as a, dad, as a father with him, how do I engage regardless of his gender identity or sexual mm -hmm. orientation as it, as it emerges? What are some core lessons that I can start leaning in with him as he's figuring out how does he relate to people? How does he flirt as, as 10 year olds are starting to play with flirting? You know, how, that, that can happen. Those are some basic things that can happen that we can build out. And George, I'm about to ready to bounce into you to talk about, about, about the specific activities and strategies that we can work with the, with the GLBTQI community. And, and I would say, uh, just listening to the framing of it, how can we support dads? I don't know if I have that answer, but I can tell you that uh, our agency works with the local uh, Q Center uh, who has a parent group and talk to, to engage those parents uh, around that uh, question. But we also have developed in-house uh, a curriculum that we call Queer Life, uh, centering the lives of uh, queer and trans youth uh, and that's a 10-week curriculum that we developed um, over the past year that we have been implementing most recently. Actually, I'm here on this Zoom while my colleagues are doing the Zoom for that particular program uh, right now. Um, but what's unique about it, if you will, is it centers their lives. And so uh, the, the question around parenting those, uh, and, and, and support from family, those issues do come up in, the, in those conversations. Uh, so the only thing I can say is that I know we are that we have that sort of uh, centering in our programming, and we also uh, through our our work work with uh, the parents through our relationship with the the local Q Center. Gina, did you have anything you wanted to? Um, yes, I uh, when it comes up to the LGBTQI community. Um, having the resources again available for them is important because in letting them know what's available to them. As parents, um, we do we do have to have have information that is available in every resources. Um, so I know that Willow um, is very good at um, communicating with dads and parents about um, the LGBT community. Um, about domestic violence or in, engaging the in gender violence or anything like that with um, the youth. Um, Black Men Achieve has a round table for men and dads um, to be able to do the same thing. Uh, um, and so does My Brother's Keeper. So I know that I've worked with them as far as bringing out um, information with the LGBTQ LGBTQ community, uh, bringing out information on trans, transgender um, and LGBT, dealing with domestic violence and, and gender violence as well. So um, making, making the information available to them is, and letting them know that they, they have a safe space that they can go to. I don't know if that answers the question that was raised in the chat. And if there's a more specific question that we can address, please uh, do. Absolutely. I did want to bring up another point that hopefully, and this is going to be a little bit more provocative uh, in, a, in a supportive way. Um, but I know that, that, George, I heard you refer to this, the, the, the notion of healthy relationship. And one of the things that I found both in terms of my work of engaging and mobilizing men, and in particular, my work of engaging and mobilizing dads is that how people understand healthy relationship does not necessarily also always have a, as a premise gender equality. And there are a lot of people walking around, some people we can all name, who are really clear about a healthy relationship being about male dominance mm -hmm. within the relationship, right? And yet, if, when we use the term healthy relationship and don't unpack that any more than that, and somebody that I'm working with in the hollers of Kentucky, not to be stereotypical, mm -hmm. um, and he understands that to mean, well, a healthy relationship is, I got the last word, a man's home is his castle, right? Then how am I inadvertently reinforcing that very 
thing that I think is dangerous and damaging by using language that is a shared language without it being unpacked. So I, I'm, I'd really like to kind of enter into a conversation around how we think really strategically and really carefully about the languaging we use to engage dads that A, engages dads, but also doesn't reinforce the bad things that we're trying to, dis, that we're, the, the whole point of us is trying to, to undermine, if that makes sense. And George, I see you unmiked yourself, so apparently you got something to say. Oh, no. <laughs> Actually, I've I, I just been thinking about it, and I, I, I believe it happens within the context of the conversation mm. that you've developed and the trust that you created in the room. But, but there has to be some unpacking first, right? We have to talk about the, what abuse looks like and what uh, uh, verbal abuse and, all of, and, and psychological, emotional abuse, right? Once you get the men in the room to un identify what those things are, then they begin to uh, focus back on, oh, whoa, I'm using that language. I'm not mm -hmm. promoting gender equality. So it starts with uh, the, the unpacking has to happen, Russ. It doesn't happen without the unpacking. And I think as facilitators in the conversations, uh, once you present it and, and they come up, uh, I mean, the thing is, we're not giving them that language. They're coming up with that language. And then once they've identified that these are abusive terms, this is abusive language, this doesn't look like it's healthy, you know, we do the gender boxes and all of those things. Now they're being held accountable for the very things that they said uh, constitutes un an abusive and unhealthy relationship. So uh, I think it starts with creating a conversation and space that unpacks that they identify uh, for themselves. And I, I would just add um, mm -hmm. to that is just having, making sure that what you're representing in your home is the same exact thing that you would want to have your children represent as well. Um, having a healthy relationship at home helps with being able to talk to them even more. Hey, I talk to mom this way, you know, or, 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 or this, is, this is the way a healthy relationship looks like. Um, also making sure in, in a, you get permission to even the school. The school has a lot of um, resources or information where they come and talk about dating violence and domestic violence and things like that. So being able to either go there and learn those. If you don't know what a, a healthy relationship is, going to the school, going to um, somewhere where you can learn these things to be able to communicate them with your children and being able to talk to them about it and learning how to respect yourself, respect others, in, which is a, a key, you know, learning to respect the others and what how they say it, or if you even see it happening, you know, being able to say, hey, this is what I don't want you to do. Okay, I don't want you to react this way. That is not a healthy relationship. A healthy relationship is being equal. Okay, being able to express yourself, being able not to hit on one another, those kinds of things is about healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I, I will say for my own, my own work here in Louisville, I, I've stopped using the term healthy relationship. Mm -hmm. um, I call it what I call it, which is uh, what my goal is equitable and respectful relationships. Um, mm. So I've just kind of completely stopped using healthy re relationship language and shifted to building equitable and respectful relationships. And in my work I'm with dads, how do uh, we how do Can you say more about that, Russ? <laughs> Tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, what more, what more do you mean? Uh, so when you say you move away from healthy relationships, is it because people can define what that looks like. And yeah. if you if you redefine it, well, maybe I'm answering your own question, my own question. Yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so but if you redefine it as equitable and respectful, we can get what that means a mu much easier is what I'm hearing you say that you didn't say, right? Is that what you and, mean? And what I find is that A, in terms of like the promotional and, and, and marketing materials, I don't have to spend time on the flyer or on the brochure or on the whatever, on the website, unpacking what I mean by healthy relationships because here it is. I'm talking about an equitable and respectful relationship. And similarly in, in, in groups, I don't have to spend that time unpacking um, healthy relationship. I can, we can go into immediately talking about how do I as a dad, how do we as dads promote equitable and respectful relationship regardless of the gender identity of our children or who they date. Now I will say it does open up a different conversation because Sometimes the response is, whoa, 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 what, what do you mean by equitable and respectful? Okay. 
which is a whole different conversation than here's what I mean by healthy. And I, 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 I am much more comfortable with that kind of direct hesitation around, I don't know that I want an equitable, respectful relationship, frankly. I got to give up some privilege if I actually have an equitable, respectful relationship. Um, I love that conversation because <laughs> that's like real, that's like honest. Let us talk about the fact that sometimes equity means I give up privilege and I don't want to give up my privilege. You know, in this the con conversation we're having right now nationally, sometimes racial equity means that me as a white person, I got to give up some privilege. And I don't know that I want to, but I know that I got to, both because I'm being called to in a different way, but because it's the right thing to do. So I find that it just opens up a different kind of conversation um, that, a different kind of conversation, let me just leave it there. Did I answer y'all's question or talk all, all the way around it? So basically just examining your own attitudes, your beliefs and stuff about um, having power and control and, and entitlement and things like that. Yeah, and, and I think I think that respectful relationship is also a little bit hard because it's so self-defined. You know, what I define as a, with me being respectful is gonna be different than, you know, a whole lot of other people. But, but I think equity does have a different kind of, there's a, there's a different kind of agreement around what we're talking about um, that isn't open to its own interpretation. I love it. There's a question in the, in the chat about how do we, how do we approach religion without, without al allowing abusive behaviors? And I'm assuming it's related to the content in terms of our work with engaging dads. Um, Yeah, how do we do that? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's actually, there's actually a, another training on faith based, um, and Quinn does, does do that as well, um, which would be a great way to get him back on and talk to, to talk about that, not only just for religious leaders, but for parents, as, um, for, for dads as well, um, to be able to explain to them the difference of, you know, when someone is trying to force religion and saying that this is the way it has to be, you know, and using Bible quotes and things like that, when in reality, equality is what we need to be um, reaching out more and talking about more um, equality and how did you put it? And respect. Equity, <laughs> equity and respect. <laughs> equity and respect. Equity and respect. Um, I told you I'm going to try to get that from you. Um, equity and respect is what we need to be able to push versus because it is in the Bible or in, in any other religious, um, whether you read a Quran or Bible, whatever you read, that we're supposed to be treated with respect and love one another. Okay. Yeah. And that's what, as dads, we need to um, put out there that we're supposed to love is in the Bible, is, is in, the, um, in the Bible or in the Quran so many times. So that's what we want to share with them, that word, love, and how we love ourselves, love love each other and love one another. And Lorian, you, you unmiked yourself. Do you want to chime no, in? No, no, no. I mean, I put it in the chat. I did unmute myself, which is an indication that <laughs> we are, you know, because this is, you know, you're, you're, you're doing such a great job, but I, I, I just want to say out loud um, for the folks who aren't, who, um, for the benefit of the folks who aren't uh, able to see the chat, that one of the things that we do after every webinar or learning exchange like this is that we compile resources, some that we've already known that we want to send out, but some that come up in the context of the conversation. And we'll make sure that we add some really wonderful resources from the Faith Trust Institute, and um, the Black Church Against Domestic Violence, which no longer exists in Atlanta, but has also archived some really amazing um, resources that help us to talk about, Gina, just what you said, just want to reinforce what you said. So for every sort of patriarchal, sexist, misogynist interpretation of something that is in scripture, whether it's the Talmud or the Bible or, or the Quran, 
Um, there's also, you know, plenty of, um, you know, statements of just what you said, love and, and equity and, and all of that, that, that belie this notion that, that people should be submissive, that women specifically should be submissive to their male partners. So I'll make sure that that is included in our follow-up to this webinar. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, and I just wanted to offer that uh, there's uh, power control wheels. Have you seen these from safe havens that have all the different uh, faith traditions and how uh, those faith traditions, by following those traditions, uh, would be able to uh, promote equity and respect in relationships. And so uh, we've worked with, uh, through a, what we call our interfaith task force, working with faith leaders from different walks of life to get them to do that within their uh, various uh, faith traditions. But I, I found that those safe haven, um, uh, I guess, power and control wheels, the best way I could describe it, uh, have a lot of cultural for the various, uh, the major, uh, the three branches, the major traditions, if you will, um, they have a specific cultural uh, context uh, or religious context based on their faith. So that might be another resource, uh, the Safe Haven Wheels. And Lorian, I have those at hand, so I'll email them to you, you know, so that you could share them with people as well, because I use them a lot as well when I'm talking to faith leaders and, and things like that. So I'll just email them to you today. And for me, uh, I think it's kind of George, you and Gina both, again, alluded to this, but I think in terms of, of reaching the faith communities, um, mm -hmm. it's important to have explicit faith partners to doing mm -hmm. that. You know, I, I am a man of faith in my faith tradition. I am a leader and I do some work, um, but I'm not a, a Southern Baptist. I am coming to you from Kentucky. So, you know, um, I'm not a Methodist. I'm not, I'm not Jewish. I'm not Buddhist or, or Muslim. So how do I identify the partners who can speak the truth right. in this conversation, speak the truth, <laughs> speak our truth <laughs> around what it means to engage and mobilize dads from that. If I'm, if I'm talking with men of faith and I want to have someone from another man of, of that faith who can speak to how are we as, as men of faith can, me, we as dads of faith can engage in this work and lean on our faith to do what we have to do. Um, I, I totally agree, Lorianne, with the Faith Trust Institute and what they're doing. And there are growing, there are growing faiths who are specifically, not dad, but are specifically involved in the work of engaging men and boys. The Presbyterians have a really powerful curriculum. The Methodists have a curriculum. Um, there's a curriculum for Jewish men. Um, mm -hmm. There's a program for Jewish men from Minch to Men. Um, from, from Jewish Women International that is a really, really vibrant program. Um, there are several uh, programs that I'm aware of within, within the Muslim community, with the Muslim faith. Um, so I think those resources are starting to emerge and starting to develop. And just if I may, Naaman is looking at how do we create a, a network of these faith, interfaith engagement efforts to do some cross-learning and cross-sharing. Um, so hopefully that'll be emerging in the next, in the next few months. And um, thank you, Lorianne, for that Faith Trust Institute. I couldn't remember where the source of that was, but that's where I got it from. Mm -hmm. um, I'm aware of time. We have about 20 minutes left in our time as the as the as this webinar. I know, Lorianne, you're going to have want some wrap up time there at the end. Um, I want to just throw it out to the to the participants and see if there are any any questions or criticisms that you want to raise um, here in these last few minutes that uh, that we can unpack and and dialogue about. I mean, I, I don't have a question, but I'm thinking because what, because for example, school is looking different for, for all of us, maybe, you know, maybe people have thoughts about what they're doing uh, because school looks different, you know, uh, you know, families and how uh, they're engaging differently, you know, and the struggles around how if it, like if you have like a ten year old and you know trying to uh, get you to do your work, but also trying to get them to do their work, and uh, how 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 are people preparing as educators for schools that are not necessarily going to be open for them? That's a question that I have. Mm -hmm. Well, I think for me that that's a real challenge here in Louisville because not only are they not physically open, but because of the differences around 
being and learning in a virtual world and the schools are not, they're shut down completely to outside people coming in and doing presentations. Um, I don't know what that means for prevention educators, but I do think that that does, means that there's a um, powerful opportunity for us to connect through and sideways notions around the school to support parents and support dads. So what I've seen here in, in Louisville throughout our JCPS public school system and in the private schools is a, an explosion in grade-based Facebook pages, Facebook groups mm -hmm. within the schools. So every, every, class, every grade in Kiernan's elementary school, every grade in the junior high school and the middle schools in this area now has Facebook pages and the, and the public school system is, is act, actively promoting these as a way for, for parents and families to network and support each other and be involved. Well, there's an, there's a, there's a, there's an avenue for us as activists and as organizers to get into those Facebook pages and start some of this conversation. It's a different kind of conversation than George, you described in terms of being in real time, being in Zoom or whatever, where you have a group who's talking about this. But I think there's an opportunity for us to throw out our perspectives and throw out this, this education and awareness raising that Gina talked about through these kinds of Facebook connections that, that more and more schools I think are, are blowing open because they understand that parents need more support right now in terms of supporting the kids to, to be successful in school. And would, Facebook, Facebook would is the opportunity. I would add one thing to that. I know I don't know if they do everywhere else, but here we got um, parent engagement programs at the city school districts and the districts, and also programs that are from the colleges that come into the schools. Um, I think it's important to reach out as educators and things like that, or uh, even prevention workers, um, to reach out to parent engagement. Um, if there's a STEP program, reach out to the STEP programs, which are programs for kids that are going, that are in high school and are going into colleges and they take them on tours. Um, but they also have a, a time where they have parent advisory boards there. So using that the, the, those groups to be able to go and talk about prevention, to be able to discuss any of the issues that need to be, any of the isms, whether it's racism, sexism, um, any ism, okay, to be able to go there and discuss those issues with them, especially at a time like this. And what they would do is probably video it or do a Zoom with the kids and to be able to um, get the word out for them. So I just, thank you. I'm just, yes, I'm just gonna like weigh in a little bit. Um, one thing uh, is, so I did put a question in the chat about if anybody has innovative strategies for how you're going to engage parents this year, given that this first semester is really dicey. Um, you know, so one thing that I just wanted to mention is that um, libraries and school districts are uh, coordinating and collaborating in a way that they have always but have like like never before and so libraries are often a way to engage parents and they're doing lots of wonderful programming the other thing is that there is somebody in every school district who is responsible for whether it's your title nine coordinator whether it's the dignity for all students act folks usually they're the same person and some of them all all those roles reside in somebody who's been designated among all of their other duties to be the community educators. Mm -hmm. And so for any of you prevention educators on the, on the line who have not engaged with those people um, or don't already have a relationship with those people, which I know so many of you already do, you know, that would be a way to strategize around how to engage parents and to make sure that you're pitching it as you know, this is an offering to support parents who are already overwhelmed and beleaguered under the current circumstances. So that's one thing that I would, I really, I, I want to offer. Um, and then the other piece is that, you know, just very briefly, I want to mention that uh, to the question about how to engage fathers who are homeless. Um, so I, I just want to mention that, you know, again, in almost every community, in every community, there is a continuum of care consortium um, that is comprised of 
you know, domestic violence homeless shelters, YWCAs, YMCAs, all of the homeless shelters that are there, food banks, you know, all sorts of people, the city, municipalities, towns come together in these consortiums. And um, that would be a great entry point. And I'm sure that your uh, domestic violence program leadership is already connected with those folks. So to find out where those, not just dads, I'm thinking, you know, any parent, to find out how to access those folks um, in terms of all of this. But that's one thing. That's just one way to think about that. But the other way to think about that is that it's just like trying to engage folks who are in our domestic violence shelters or in our programs. Those people are really in crisis right now. It's likely that an offering to be a part of a conversation around, you know, what dads can do or what parents can do um, is not necessarily going, <clears throat> going to be embraced wholly as something that people have the bandwidth to do just for the homeless population. That doesn't mean we shouldn't try. That doesn't mean we don't make offerings. I just, as just as a word of, war, war, word of warning, after doing this for several decades, it, that may not be the best um, positioning for getting folks into a, a community mobilizing, community engagement strategy is what we're suggesting. But it, it can be done. So I'm not suggesting that we don't try. And that raises another point for me that I think it we hasn't arisen yet in this conversation, which frankly kind of surprises me. But and that and, and I don't want to I want to be careful that I'm not necessarily targeting homeless dads. And there are some dads that we definitely do not want engaged mm. in this work, right? <laughs> there are some men who engage in fatherhood work that are doing bad stuff or doing work that is completely contrary to our, this agenda. And I think there needs to be some nuance in the, how we're working to engage dads to not get drawn into the fact of trying to get every dad in Louisville to, to try and do this work. There are some dads, frankly, that Thank you, no. And most of the time they will self-select out, thankfully. <laughs> but sometimes I need, in terms of my organizing, I need to help them to self-select out. Um, that I think is an important part of the conversation that, that and, I, and, I, and it, it, I know it's complex, and I know it's nuanced, but if I'm gonna have dads in the room who are promoting a, a, an agenda that is counter to what I'm trying to promote, then we can't be in the same room together. If that makes sense. And I guess, I don't know, Jennifer, Lorianne, we didn't really talk about how much time you all need to wrap up. Um, I, I was thinking of leaving you all five minutes. Okay, so we've got about seven more minutes for, for chit chat. If, if anyone who is participating has something you wanna ask or say. I do want to say that the pledge is also available in Spanish. So if they were to go to the um, website, that the pledge is in English and in Spanish, if you ever need to use it for any of your groups as well, for any of your prevention groups. I wanted to lastly throw out one of the conversations that I had, one of the questions I had pre-prepared that we haven't gotten to is, um, that, that point around um, when, I look, when I do a scan around what little there is in terms of engaging dads, almost all of it is focused on engaging dads of daughters. And a lot of it has this method, message kind of of, you know, how do, I, how do I promote, support my daughter to be the strong, empowered woman that I want her to be? And there mm -hmm. seems to be much, much less information and, and accessible information around how we engage dads of sons. And how do I, Gina, you made this point, how do I raise my, my son to be the kind of man who I would have my daughter date, frankly, if I, have a, if I had a daughter. Um, and I would be really curious to throw out to, to Laura, Gina and George, your, your thoughts around how do, we, how do we make sure that we're not focusing on dads of daughters, but equally raising up dads of sons, because we all have a, we all have a role to play, we all have a position to, to take in terms of, of engaging this work. I would just say that here in Rochester, we're fortunate to have the Father, Father's Initiative that helps um, fathers be able to 
um, work better with their children. So we're fortunate with that. I can put that up for you. But also the fact that I can understand where you're coming from because the things that I talked to my daughter about and my family talk my my family talked to my daughter about are not the same things that we talked to my son about. Thinking out of the box when we shouldn't have been, we should have been thinking about the same thing for sons as it is for um, a, a female because they all anybody can go through any issues of violence or any issues of gender issues. We don't know what's going on. So we want to be able to address them whole as a whole, not, you know, to say one thing to your daughter and not to your son. You, uh, rape is being committed um, for both men and women. But domestic violence is being committed for both men and women. So we want to be able to talk to them about all those issues um, and be able to say, this is what's going on um, versus just Directly, directing it just to the um, daughters. Because violence is happening everywhere. I think Russ and uh, Gina, you speak of a utopian vision about how we get dads to um, bring, to, to have the same sort of emphasis around, because I have a son, I wanna make sure that my son is, is, is looking to be in equitable, respectful relationships that are also healthy. But I, but I, but the, 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 the real, the reality is in right now in 2020, as of today, <laughs> they're only responding to the fact that they have daughters, right? That that's what is the motivation. So maybe is mm -hmm. because they have daughters is a way to get them in the room. And then we say, now, what are you going to tell your son about that? How mm -hmm. are you going to raise an anti, uh, a son who's anti-rapist, right? Who's not going to do that, right? And I, I, I'll share with you that. Uh, when we talk about conversations, you know, when my son went to college, I sent him um, a little bag of things because I didn't want him to, even though we had values around relationships and sex, we did, I didn't want him to make a mistake, if you will, right? So my daughters pointed out to me, you didn't send us to school with a bag of, of, of goodies to make sure that things didn't happen or anything like that. What's that about, Dad? You know, so we had a real conversation around that. But at the same time, I am very blunt as a, as a dad. I'm speaking now of a dad, uh, and so maybe this will work in terms of engaging dads. But I'm also very blunt around conversations around sex and sexuality and, and my uh, talking to them very bluntly about, you know, when, you know, because we always think about protecting them from other boys, if you will. So look, if he comes to you and says you're beautiful and all that, that's great. Now what else you got, right? So let, let's hear some other kinds of mm -hmm. conversations. Let's, Let's talk about some other engagement. But for my son, it's the same thing. You know, I think the best example is, is what he sees right in front of him, right? If I'm not, and I, I know that's, well, okay, if, you, if, if the guy, if the dad isn't in the house, it's a different story. But I'm only speaking from my direct experience. If I'm not treating mom with respect and dignity, then I'm, I'm planting the seed for him and them about what they should expect in their relationship. So... Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that what my daughters see is that they're going to be in respectful, healthy relationships because that's what they see. And the same thing with my son, because that's what he's seeing. And so I still think that the seed or the, the, the lore is because you have daughters. And I know a lot of uh, uh, my, my female identified colleagues in the work hate the fact that that's the only way we can get men engaged in this work. But I'm sorry, that is the way that they are responding because they want to protect their little baby girl, right? So, mm -hmm. but then when they get in the room, all right, now you got all this stuff for your son, like, you know, the exercise where you, uh, mm -hmm. I think I did this. I first saw this, I think, in Russ's workshop and this could did back in 2013, where, you know, mm -hmm. all the things that women have to do when mm -hmm. they go out and all the things we tell them to do, right, to prevent to prevent themselves from, to be, from being a victim of a sexual assault. And then the, the list of but, by what we tell our boys to do, right? Not to say that they're not gonna be victims, but, and we noticed that that page was empty, whereas the women had a whole list of things that they've been told since birth, carry this, do that, don't walk this way, don't walk that way. Don't wear this, don't wear that. Well, but your, your story is, you know, so important for everybody to hear, which is, it's not just the instructions that are explicit, it's the implicit instructions that you gave to your sons versus your daughter 
by sending him off with a bag of condoms to college and not your daughters, right? And so I know you and I know your daughters and I'm proud of them for calling you out on that. <laughs> but <laughs> it's not as subtle as we think. That's right. very, that's actually really important and critical that that ha and I love that story, George. Thank you yes. for sharing it. Yes. Um, and, and it makes sense that you would do that. Of course it does because that's the socialization part of it. That's and I think it does raise raise a point around the this this notion, George, as you raised around as dads of sons, it is just as terrifying. You know, the evidence is is really murky about what is different between my ten year old son who's growing up in a relatively stable two parent home and the ten year old son who who grows up in a two parent relatively stable home who becomes one of those guys who do those those kinds of things. Mm. You know, as a ten year old, there's not a big difference between my son and the kind of men who do these things, right? And so there is a mess, there is a call for dads to think about, you know what? My, my son right now is not terribly different at 10 than that 17 year old boy who picked up a gun in Kenosha and, and killed two black people and shot, and, and shot a third one, right? There's not a huge difference at 10 between us two, those two boys, probably from the evidence that we have right now. Mm -hmm. So there is a motivation for dads around, how, how do I double down to make sure my son doesn't go there? How does my son, how do I set it up so that my son doesn't go to college and become one of those, one of those first, first semester red zone perpetrators, right? Um, there's a different, I think there's a different call that we can use around the, the fear that we have as, as dads of sons that parallels the fear that we have as dads who are dads of daughters. And I know we're right about at the end, so. And, and one quick correction, uh, the victims were white in Kenosha, just one quick correction. Yes, yes. And Russ, I know you're working really hard to make sure that Kiernan is not that person. So, and I know we all are. Is there, I do have just two minutes worth of a wrap up. Uh, George and Gina, is there anything that you are burning to say? Uh, I just wanted to, uh, just in terms of engaging the men and their sons, a part of the challenge is that the, if engaging their sons, they're likely to perpetuate some of the same misogyny and all of that, that we're hoping to get them not to do. So that's what I meant yeah. to say as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, George. And Gina, Gina, I just want to add um, the fact that we have so many single dads today that we also have to be careful of how we're addressing the youth today because there's so many things. I, I'm, I'm, I can believe when I've seen how many um, single dads are out here today raising their children mm -hmm. and the work that needs to get continuously get done just for them um, to be able to raise their boys or girls. Um, so First of all, Russ, thank you for even thinking about us and being able to bring up some information on, you know, what is going on in our communities with men and, and dads. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Um, Russ, I, I want to give you a moment too. I just want to, I thank everyone for a very compelling conversation. Remember, this is just the beginning. So those of you who contributed to the chat, and to the conversation, I really appreciate that. So we'll continue to convene conversations with Russ as our consultant, consultant. just like this, we'll do this for the remainder of the year and hopefully long-term um, as we develop more tools and resources that you can use to engage dads. Um, Gina, George, Russ, thank you so much for sharing your expertise Thanks to all of the participants for your questions and your comments and your contributions. Uh, in terms of the resources that folks were asking about, you know, we, my intention is that if you have resources that we haven't mentioned today that you think we might not know about that could, we could bring to bear on this kind of strategy, please let us know. We'll make sure that it's in the toolkit. And I think that together, we can make sure that we are inclusive of all of the things we talked about today, sexuality and gender, you know, all of the things that we need to do to acknowledge the intersection between, you know, really 
everything that we've talked about, race and class and ableism issues. You know, let's make sure that we're giving all of the prevention educators across the state those kinds of tools that, so that they can engage dads effectively. So this is just, it's a work in progress. It's just the beginning. Please hang with us, stay with us as we learn from you and we learn from dads and we learn from all of the consultants that we're bringing into this project. Russ, do you wanna have the last word? Oh, just a tremendous thank you to Gina and George for your leadership in this work in the state and, and your, your how wonderfully transparent and open you were to this conversation. To Lori and Jennifer and Niskadev for your leadership in this initiative. And to the panelists, as Lorianne said, you know, if, as you all have thoughts or suggestions or questions around tools or resources that would help you do this work, let Lorianne or myself know and we'll, we'll figure out how to find them, develop them, borrow them, adapt them, adopt them, steal them. <laughs> we'll, we will figure out how to get those to you as, the best of, as best as we can. Call it borrowing, Russ. We don't steal, we borrow. <laughs> <laughs> And I we just, borrow very freely. Sure. And the last Absolutely. thing, I want to make sure that you, um, that everyone go, gets to go to the National Father's Day pledge and utilize the pledge that's on there and also take the pledge if, um, if possible. Um, Thank you for that invitation, Gina. I know that Jennifer did post the link, mm -hmm. so you could join that. Um, just visit the website and it will sort of take you through. If you'd like to do a local initiative, you're also invited to do that. And Gina can support you with that for sure. Gina, do we have your permission to add that to the follow-up resources? You sure can. All right, wonderful. All right, so I'll or make if they want, Or if they wanna join us this, this upcoming year, 2021, we're planning to take it to Washington. So that's a really exciting thing. That. Let's go to D.C. together. Let's all go to D.C. together. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Quentin is working hard with me on this, and we're going to be reaching out to a lot of the organizations that are already doing it to meet us down there as well. Russ, you have to come. <laughs> That's wonderful. Let's let a group all across the country to come with us. Folks, if, it, if it, we were just a little over time, so I'm just going to make sure that we wrap this up, but um, we'll make sure that we connect with the panelists for those of you who are attending, let us know if there was something that you would like to see the panelists provide to you that we haven't already mentioned, and we'll make sure that we put all of that into the mix. Thank you all so much. As you end this week and go into a long weekend, I hope you all get the rest and the rejuvenation that you deserve. Thanks for all that you do. Be safe. Thank you, Russ, so much. Be safe and Thanks, well. Joe. Thank you. Okay. Yeah.